All righty, let's pick it up then on session 38, lesson 7, page 10 of your outline, section 119 in the harmony. All right, what did we do last week? Well, last week we began on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee in the area of Magdala, Magadan, modern Kibbutz Ginusar. And Yeshua and the disciples got into a boat and it says they went over to the east side of the shore, to Gentile territory. And there, we don't know exactly where, but Jesus used the isolation to teach his disciples to beware of three types of false teaching. The uh, leaven of the Herodians, the leaven of the Pharisees, and the leaven of the Sadducees. Well, they learned that lesson, they got that lesson, and then Yeshua said, well, let's head up to Bethsaida. So they got in a boat and uh, then traveled up the Sea of Galilee, north, to the little village of Bethsaida, where Yeshua healed a man who was blind. And it was a unique uh, miracle because it was a two-stage two miracle. It's the only miracle that's uh, recorded to happen in two stages. First, he was partially sighted, and then he was fully sighted. And that represented the state of the disciples, partially sighted, later to be fully sighted, and also the state of Israel, partially sighted and eventually to be fully sighted. So after performing that miracle in Bethsaida, Yeshua decided to head north to Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea Philippi uh, at the base of Mount Hermon. So he went up north, again out of Jewish territory. And here again is a map, then Galilee is in the circle there. He leaves Galilee, he goes up to Caesarea Philippi, which is in Syria, which is in Gentile territory. He's isolating himself from the uh, Jewish community in order to teach his disciples and to prepare them for the ministry they'll have when he leaves. Uh, up in Caesarea Philippi, we saw that it was located at the base of Mount Hermon, the highest mountain in uh, the Holy Land, uh, covered with snow during the winter. And as we went into Caesarea Philippi, we saw that it was overshadowed, the town was overshadowed by a huge uh, cliff. And uh, the Banyas River comes out of that cliff, it becomes one of the four headwaters of the Jordan. And in the Banyas, of course, there are small stones that fall off the cliff and are washed down the river. So there at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked, Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, You are the Christ, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus commended him for that. That was something that God had revealed to him. That flesh and blood did not reveal it to him. And then he said, You are Petras. And it's a play on words of Peter's name. And the Greek word Petras there is masculine and it means a small stone, a stone that you can pick up and toss like the small stones in the Banyas River at the base of the cliff at Caesarea Philippi. So Petros, Peter, you are a small stone, but then he goes on to say, but upon the Petra, and a Petra is a feminine word, and it means a huge massive cliff rock, but upon the Petra, I will build my church. So there's two distinct elements here in Yeshua's statement. And we know what the Petras is, that's Peter, very clearly stated. But what is the Petra? Well, commentators normally say it is, the, it is Peter's faith, but I shared with you that I think there's a better position in the fact that the rock or the stone and or the Petra is often referred to, refers to the Messianic person. So I think Jesus is pointing to himself and saying, uh, no, Peter, it's not your faith. Uh, I am the foundation of the church. Yes, I am the Messiah. Yes, I am the Son of God. But I am also the foundation of the church that I will be building in the future. And that whole idea of um, Jesus as the foundation of the church, I think, is picked up by Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 11. In the middle of this statement, he says, like a ma wise master builder, I laid a foundation. And at the end of the statement, he states, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. So he is the rock. 
He is the foundation we build upon. Everything else is sand. We build upon Yeshua. Then uh, Jesus uh, uh, talked about binding and loosing, which we learned were rabbinical terms for permitting or denying. And it, it was used judicially and it was used legislatively. And eventually all the apostles received this, this um, authority. And it was not passed on to you and me. There's nothing that says apostolic authority was passed on to you and me. And the apostles used this authority uh, to permit or to deny when they wrote the New Testament. All the positive commands are loosing, that is permitting. And all the negative commands are binding, that is forbidding. And I just showed you one example in Romans 6 where the Apostle Paul does that. He says, do not let sin, negative command, reign in your mortal body. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin. So he's forbidding us. God is forbidding us there. He's binding us. He's forbidding us from doing certain things. And then he permits us to do other things. At the end of the statement, present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. There's your positive legislative comment. So that's loosing, per, uh, permitting us to do certain things. And like I said last week, this has nothing to do with the doctrine that's floating around of, of binding and loosing Satan. Nothing to do with that. That's ripping this totally out of context and um, a rather imaginative exegesis. We do not have the authority to bind and loose Satan. And the only binding and loosing Satan that I know of in Scripture is Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2. And notice, it ain't us who does it. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Well, that's the only individual that has the authority to bind Satan, the angel. We do not. We do not. Have, Question. If uh, Messiah kept those who were demon possessed from saying who he was, he held them, kept them, for, and then Paul healed that one gal who was mm -hmm. possessed. Okay. So she wouldn't say that he was from the Lord or something else, or she kept interrupting his ministry. So it seems... Uh, well, that's not binding or loosing yeah. Satan. The healing, over them, yeah. well, yes, God, God does allow healings and uh, exorcisms to occur at his will. Okay, I, you know, we pray and God acts. You know, it's a pet peeve of mine that we say the power of prayer, you guys. Now, that sounds heretical, doesn't it? But I don't believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the power of God in response to our prayer. We are powerless. God is omnipotent. He has his program all laid out for us. And I don't know how prayer works. How can an omnipotent, all-present, all-powerful God who has his plan all laid out be affected by our prayers? But he has integrated our prayers into his program. So we pray, and then he responds in response to our prayers. So it's his God's power. Pretty okay. good God. Pretty good God. And if he wants to heal or... Uh, throw out a demon, that's up to him. We have the privilege of asking for that. Yeah. yeah. He's sometimes working in our minds, the things that he wants us to do. Sure. Oh, sure. So sure. So it's his work being done, but he opens our minds to do it. Yeah, that's... We have nothing to do with the, with the how it comes down, but we are... Yeah, that, that's the paradox of the human-divine interrelationship. Yeah. Well, that's the paradox. He's the king of kings. He's in charge. But we play our part. And we make responsible decisions. Now, don't ask me how the two railroad tracks hold together. Remember, it's the ties that hold them all together. I don't know how to resolve all that. Other than trust God. He knows what he's doing. And he's plenty strong and able to do it. All right. I don't want to belabor this. One more question, okay? Carolyn? If, but, Bob, if God wants to test our faith, then... How can we even measure our faith to pass this test? You see, it, it, it's up to him. Yeah, we don't, we don't, many times we don't even know what we need to learn. <laughs> and we, we learn it over time and we kind of assimilate it. And uh, we, we act and walk and think differently. Because if you look back in your life, if you're a student of the word and trying to follow God's will, 
you look back in your life six years ago and you see you've changed gradually you know he does it in our lives you know and he doesn't do it like a like a, we did it in school where you had a test and you got an A or B grade this is life that he's training us through every moment of every day is part of our growth period you know it's growth it's not a test in the sense of a of a, a final test for your class it's growth steady slow uh, pay, uh, day by day okay well let's go on you guys um, all right, that brings us to section 119. I'm pretty sure that's where we are. Yeah. We're at section 119. And section 119 is on page 117 of your harmony. Remember, in section 118, we saw that the disciples were partially sighted. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. They are partially sighted. They know to avoid false doctrine. They've got the right doctrine down. They know who Jesus the Messiah is. But this paragraph will show us that they are still partially blind. They're still learners. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is a learner. Day by day, step by step, we're learning and growing. So there we see that they have not reached the graduation yet. And this is also the first clear announcement of his program of death and resurrection. Peter's confession marks the beginning of the instruction about his coming death and resurrection. This is key uh, material they need to learn. Now they should have known it if they were students of the prophets, students of the word, this would not be new stuff to them. But Yeshua has to bring it to their mind and um, clarify it all for them. They don't get it at this point. So let's start with verse 21 of the Matthew account. That's the left-hand column in the middle of page 117. Verse 21 at the top, top of the left-hand column. From that time, Jesus the Messiah began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. So I've got a quick outline of his teaching there to, his, to the disciples. He's going to die in Jerusalem. It won't, he won't die in any other place. He will suffer many things. Of course, that's a reference to uh, the passion of the Messiah, his, uh, uh, the struggles that he went through culminating in the cross. He would die, as Isaiah 53 teaches, the Messianic person would die, but he would be raised from the dead. Again, another item that Isaiah 53 teaches. So this is not new. All this stuff is in the prophets. So in response to this, Peter shows that he's partially blind, and he responds by rebuking the Lord. And that Greek word rebuke, translated rebuke, means strong disapproval. Peter doesn't like this. So he expresses strong disapproval of what the Lord is teaching. Verses 22 and 23. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Now, I don't know if I'd have the guts to do that. <laughs> this is the guy who stilled the waters and stilled the, the uh, storm. This is the guy that cast out demons. This is the guy that raised people from the dead. This is the guy that's healing people. You know, I don't know if I'd be quite have the guts Peter has there. Maybe it's just the chutzpah. I don't know. But he does it. Question. Maybe it was just in the sense that, oh, gosh, don't let that happen. No, wait a second here. We'll see that it's a little different. Okay, next verse. Next verse. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. All right. Now, does Jesus know Peter's name? Yeah. yeah, he knows his name. So when he calls him Satan, he's not making a mistake here. 
You know, he's not misidentifying him. He's pointing out that Peter is under Satan's influence in this area. He's under the world's influence, under mankind's influence. He's doing Satan's work, the world system's work, human work, to try and keep Yeshua off of the cross. This will never happen to you. You won't suffer. You won't die. And you know, this is, for Yeshua, this is another temptation that's come at an opportune time. Remember way back when, at the temptations of Yeshua? Remember Luke chapter 4, verse 13? And when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. Here is one of them. Here is one of them, provided by Peter, of all people. Okay? So Yeshua has to rebuke Peter for his uh, part in this temptation. And then this incident props, prompts Yeshua to teach three lessons regarding discipleship. Peter needs some lessons in discipleship. The first lesson is identify with his rejection in verse 24. Verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You see, Peter has to learn something here. Peter is not acting like a disciple here. He's, act, he's not acting like a learner. He's acting like the teacher, right? This will never happen to you. Because the operative idea here is to deny himself. Wow. Question. When Jesus said, deny yourself, and take up your cross, those times, because the disciples didn't have any idea about the cross, Jesus was going to be on. Well, they knew all about the cross. The Romans crucified yeah. Jewish people right and left. Right. Yeah. Okay, so, is this referring to his cross or just people who died, you know, criminals who died on the cross? Uh, we'll get to that, okay? Alrighty? Okay. So, the operative here, idea here is to deny himself. Peter is not doing that. Peter wants things done his way, right? He's not acting as the learner. He's doing just like what we do all the time, don't we? Have you ever told God what to do? Sure you have. I have. Peter's telling God what to do. You know, he's not being a disciple. He's not being a learner. Okay? Now, um, as G2 was asking, what about this carrying the cross? Now, this is not a call to suffering. It's a call to commitment. Suffering may or may not come. Um, you know, a lot of people view this taking up the cross as suffering. And they say, oh, my mother-in-law, she's my suffering. I have to bear with my mother-in-law. You know, things like that. This is not a call to suffering. This is a call to commitment. To commitment. Suffering may or may not follow. But the, the admonition here is to make Yeshua number one in your life. Peter is making Peter number one in his life, right? That's what we put up with, you know, look out for number one. That's what the world says, doesn't it? Look out for number one. If you don't look out for number one, who's going to look out after you? You know? But Yeshua says, make me number one. Make me number one. Follow me as a learner. So Peter has to be smacked down a little bit here. That's what's happening. Peter's acting a little bit arrogant and... Um, trying to tell Yeshua what to do. All right, verse 25, Yeshua goes on. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. So the next statement tells us that a disciple, however, must be prepared for the worst case scenario, martyrdom if necessary. Now following Jesus does not guarantee martyrdom, but it might come. So be ready for the worst case scenario. Uh, verse 26, next page. Page 118. Upper left corner, Matthew 16, 26. Third lesson. For what, will, for what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and, for, and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? 
The third statement tells us that if martyrdom does come to somebody who's making Jesus first, it will be worth it. It will be worth it because your soul is much more valuable than all the material wealth or privilege or fame that the world contains. Now, I'm sad to say that you and I as American believers do not understand and identify with this call. Believers in other parts of the world do. You can bet that Pastor Yosef in Iran identifies with this call. Yeah, we have never undergone persecution yet. We don't know what Yeshua is talking about here. And I'm afraid we tend to make us first. Now, uh, you, remember, you guys, some of you are old enough to remember the Iron Curtain. Remember that? Eastern European Christians were persecuted in Romania especially. That was the worst place. Well, whenever I met with Eastern European Christians back in those days, I was totally humbled because I saw very clearly that I was a spiritual wimp. And I'm sorry, you guys, everybody in this room is a spiritual wimp because we have not gone through the fire. And when you meet believers from Russia, and you meet believers from Romania, and I'm sure if you meet believers from Iran today or Iraq today, they've been through the fire. They know what this is all about. Okay, so this is a call to commitment. It's not a call to suffering, although suffering may come. It is not a call to martyrdom, although martyrdom may come. He's saying, make Yeshua number one in your life, as the, as the scripture says, we are to die to self, we are to become a living sacrifice. That's the idea here. Those, those ideas will be picked up later by Paul. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Well then, is, are you saying that all martyrs are zealots, but not all zealots are martyrs? Well, I guess you could say that. Because if you're willing to die for Yeshua, you're a zealot. <laughs> but not all zealots are going to experience that. That's true. All martyrs are zealots, but not all zealots. Are That's probably a pretty fair statement. Okay. All righty, let's move on to section 120. Uh, section 120, the coming of the Son of Man in judgment. This is page 11. Page 11, top of the page. And we'll pick it up in the Mark account. The um, Mark account is the middle column. Excuse me. Yes, the Mark account is the middle column on page 118. Uh, verse 38 there, section 120, page 118. Verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, his emphasis here is on that generation. The generation guilty of the unpardonable sin. Remember the punishment of the unpardonable sin is the destruction of, Jer of Jerusalem and the temple. They are doomed. They are doomed to destruction. Nothing can change it. Remember the sign of Jonah will be given to that generation. The sign of resurrection. So to be ashamed of Jesus is to reject him. And many in Israel will reject the sign of resurrection. It is rejected by many in Israel right down to this day. Many will retain allegiance to this generation because of unbelief and because of the world's contempt and because of cultural rejection. But in return, when Yeshua comes in glory, when he comes as the judge, he will refuse to claim those who reject him as his own. For example, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 7, 20 through 23. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Words are cheap. Right? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. Well, they weren't doing it for Yeshua. They were doing it for themselves. 
And there's plenty of people out there that are these days. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And uh, these people who reject Yeshua will suffer shame. That comes out in 1 John 2.28. Question. If people today are still being punished for identifying with this generation, then is the punishment for the unpardonable sin continuing on through this day? The punishment for the unpardonable sin was finished in, in 70 A.D. with the destruction of the temple. But the spiritual punishment was lost, eternal loss. Well, anyone who dies without accepting Yeshua suffers eternal spiritual loss. Anyone. But that's not connected to the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin uh, has a punishment. The punishment is the destruction of the temple and, and Jerusalem in 70 AD. We will get there. I thought there was a spiritual punishment too. If you die, well, yes, it's true. If you die rejecting Yeshua, yeah. you, enter in, you enter into spiritual judgment. Yes. That's true for everybody. But that's not the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is committed by the nation of Israel while Jesus was, was present, and it's the rejection of Jesus on the bounds of, grounds of being demon-possessed. It was committed while alive. Okay? Entering into permanent spiritual judgment is when you die. If you die in an unsaved state, everybody enters into a permanent state of judgment. The unpardonable sin was committed while these people were alive and while Jesus was present. It cannot be committed today. Okay? Question. Bob, it seems that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit would be a continual, um, it's inexcusable, but some people blaspheme, but they don't know they're blaspheming. But the ones who, who um, purposely blaspheme, they know they're blaspheming and they blaspheme. That's the unforgettable, but on, and on a spiritual plane, you think? Well, uh, Carolyn, don't take the definition of the unpardonable sin out of context. It must be developed from the context in which it fell. And in the context in which it fell, it's the rejection of the Messiahship of Jesus on the grounds of being demon-possessed while he was present by the nation Israel. Cannot be committed today. Okay? Any sin you do today while you're alive can be forgiven. Okay? But if you enter into the state of death rejecting Yeshua, you will experience judgment for eternity. That's true powerlessness. Hmm? That's true powerlessness. That's true. Okay, so let's move on then, okay? Alrighty. Alright, let's pick it up then on Mark chapter 9. Whoops. I got, I didn't, I, uh, didn't read 1 John 2.28 for us. When Yeshua returns in glory, not everyone will be claimed as his own, and those that are not will experience shame. 1 John 2.28 Now, little children, abide in him. That's another way of saying put him first. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. So if we hang on to Yeshua, we're not going to be ashamed when he comes. We are going to have confidence and joy. But those that reject him will, will try to hide themselves under the rocks in shame, shrink away. All righty. Let's move on to the first verse of Mark 9. Middle of the page there, section 120. And he was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So his next statement is that some, not all, but some of the apostolic group will not die before they see the glory that he will have in his kingdom. And the emphasis here is seeing his glory. Some of the apostles will see his glory before they die, and that promise is going to be kept on the very next paragraph, paragraph 121. And uh, paragraph 121 is section se lesson 7, page 12 of your outline, top of the page. And let's pick it up on the uh, Matthew account, left-hand column, page 119, verse 1 at the top left corner of the page, the Matthew column. 
And six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. So now the sum are listed. Not all the apostles, but only Peter, James, and John. And they ascend a very high mountain. Now what mountain is this? There are two possible locations. The traditional location is uh, Mount Tabor. Now they are up in Caesarea Philippi in, on the right hand side of the map here. Mount Tabor is li located in the lower left side of the map here in the Jezreel Valley. This is Mount Tabor. However, they are in Caesarea Philippi at this time. But Mount Tabor is the traditional location of the uh, Transfiguration. Here's a picture of Mount Tabor I took uh, from Nazareth looking across the Jezreel Valley. And you can see it looming up there in the middle of the Jezreel Valley. Here's another view of it and you can see a structure on top of the mountain. And the way you get up to that structure is in this road. Can you see this road here, the switchback road? And believe me, it's as bad as it looks. I believe buses do not go up there. Now in 94 I went up there with Dr. Fruchtenbaum, but the, uh, the three, we had three little minivans. And if you've ever been with Dr. Fruchtenbaum, the way he drives in a minivan going up that road, it'll turn your hair white. <laughs> And I hope you hear that, Arnold. <laughs> All right. That's quite a road. It's qu quite an amazing road. When you get up to the top, you find a Franciscan church uh, that is um, marking the traditional location of the Transfiguration. However, I don't believe this is the best location. I think the better location is not Mount Tabor here in the, in the uh, Galilee, but back up near Caesarea Philippi, at the base of Mount Hermon, base of Mount Hermon. So I believe that they went up from Caesarea Philippi somewhere up on the slopes of Mount Hermon. And uh, you'll see, here's that picture of Mount Hermon again, again 9,000 feet. It sometimes has snow on it year round. Here's a picture of it in winter. If you go up there in winter, you'll find there's an Israeli uh, ski lodge up there. And the Israelis do a lot of skiing. And in 94, when I was up there, uh, we were able to go up the uh, chairlift to the very, very highest point in the area and look west over the Hula Valley. A very, very amazing uh, view of Israel. We could not look east because they didn't want us to take pictures to the east because that's where an Israeli listening point is located, looking into Syria. Now here's another view of the mountain at a different time of year and you can see some of the remnants of the snow. And can you see the listening point up there? Uh, that's where it's located. Now I'll take my camera and I'll zoom in to the maximum uh, zoom of my camera and there you can see a little bit of it. You can see some of the towers and radar domes. The Israelis are looking into Syria, keeping watch on the Syrian army 24-7. Okay. Very important and strategic location. So there's a uh, Hermon in the summer, and uh, this was the last time we were there. No snow on the mountain that year. All right. Well, that will bring us to um, a discussion of Matthew 17:1 after the break. So go ahead and take your break and listen for the shofar, and we'll pick it up in a few minutes. All right, we're underway with uh, section 121, the transfiguration of Jesus. And uh, I've explained to you why I feel that, um, well, I've explained to you the two options for the location of the transfiguration, the traditional location of Mount Tabor and the um, better location, uh, Mount Hermon. So the confession of Peter is... Uh, somewhere on the slopes of Mount Hermon where Caesarea Philippi is located. Now as we looked at Matthew 17 1 we saw that Matthew says that six days later they went up the mountain and if we look at the Luke account and when we will in just a moment he will say about eight days. Now we don't know why there's a difference between six days or eight days Luke is probably being indefinite or he's being um, uh, inclusive, including the day of the confession and 
uh, the day of the transfiguration and w as well as the days of ascent. Matthew may be exclusive, numbering only the days of the ascent. We don't know why. We'll have to ask them when we get to, uh, to meet them. So uh, Luke chapter 9, 28. That's the right-hand column on page 119. And some eight days after these sayings, it came about that he took along Peter and John and James, and they went up on the mountain to pray. Well, that's very clear. We knew why they went up the mountain. Jesus wanted to pray. That was the purpose. Now, what happens when he's praying? Let's look at the Mark account. That's the middle column, verse 3. Mark 9, verse 3. And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. So the transfiguration occurs, covered also by Matthew 17, 2. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And Luke covers that too. Verse 29. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is the glory that Jesus has, the Shekinah glory, is shining through the veil of his body. It's penetrating through his body, which served as a veil to the glory. This is the glory that he will have in the kingdom. And a description of that glory was also given to us by John in Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, when it is made to glow in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. Well, if you're familiar with Daniel and you're familiar with Ezekiel, you see these images from those prophets coming out very clearly. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. So quite an amazing description of Yeshua. The promise of seeing his glory is fulfilled. And this is about the best illustration I could find of that. The promise of seeing his glory is fulfilled. Now the word used to describe the event is the basis for our word metamorphosis. The Greek word there is in your outline, I'm sure, let's see, uh, I'm sure I put it there. What page? Page 12. Okay, metamorphose. Where'd it go here on my notes? Yeah, metamorphose. It means to change to another form. And of course we use that word to describe a caterpillar changing into a butterfly. And if you've ever seen that happen, or know what goes on, it is an incredible, an incredible process that really includes a death and a total changing into a new form. By the way, in our library, we do have a, a video on metaphor, metamorphosis. Yeah, and it shows Christosis was interesting in itself as a name. What? Christosis, that's what it, that the... The chrysalis? Oh, yeah, okay. That's Christosis, Chris. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. All right, so, so when Yeshua put on humanity, he voluntarily denied himself and he added humanity to his deity, thereby veiling his glory. He never gave up being God, but he veiled who he was in a human body. And that's what Paul's talking about in Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself. And the description of what it means to empty himself comes next. Taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He's, not, he's no longer the king of kings. He's now taking the form of a servant, of a slave. He's no longer 
uh, appearing in the form of God Almighty, but he's appearing in human form. He never gave up his deity, but he clothed it in humanity. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's a metamorphosis, isn't it? Now remember, Yeshua is always acting as a servant in the Gospels. And that will explain many, many, many of the questions that people ask and many of the statements that Jesus makes. Always remember that he's always functioning as a servant. Doing what the Father commands him to do. That's what a servant does. A servant obeys the Master. All right. So he veiled his glory by putting on humanity and now he allows the Father to unveil his glory. And go to the top of page 13. Why do I say that? Because the thought here, the word here is passive. The subject, in, in, when something is passive, the subject is acted upon. The subject receives the action. So here the Father unveils his Son's glory. And he shows the disciples outwardly what Yeshua's inner being is truly like. The veil is parted. And so his glory shines through his human body. Now I did a horrible typo there. The one, two, third sentence down in your outlines, it says Messiah's glory shines right through his human body. The word should be revealing. Please cross out receiving. Oh, that was a bad typo. That's a bad one. Whew. Revealing the deity he possessed. Revealing the deity he possessed. Man. That one, that one just made my... That one just made my skin crawl when I saw that. Where did that come from? Oh boy, yes. Then, then Bob, let's say if you could, if you could show us a before and after. Let's say what you should the pre-incarnate Christ before versus after. What difference would there be? What What do you think? Uh, the, the before and after. Before the, he, he took on the, the human form because that forever changed him in the after effect. Well, all I can say is to go to Ezekiel and look at the description that Ezekiel sees um, of the divine chariot there in chapter 1, I believe it is, and go to the book of Daniel, and Daniel describes Yeshua receiving the kingdom. That's all I can say. That's how he appeared. And then Revelation chapter 1. That's, the, that's where I would direct you to, to get a glimpse of Yeshua and his glory. Well, in this case, it would be a difference without a distinction. Because you have God and man and man and God. Well, you guys, let's go on, okay? <laughs> I don't want to get into this. We're getting off track here, okay? All right? He veiled his glory by putting on humanity. Yes. Okay? Let's, let's leave it at that, okay? Okay? He always stays there, so <laughs> <laughs> That would be a no. <laughs> no, but, no, 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 right. no he's human, but he's, he's probably changed in the heavenly, it says in Ephesians. I didn't see him in his pre-incarnate state. I can't tell you. Okay. <laughs> All I can do is direct you to scripture. Okay. We have to be satisfied with some things some of the time. All righty. Now, with Yeshua, our two Old Testament individuals, Moses and Elijah, in verses 30 and 31. Right-hand column. And behold, two men were talking with him. They were Moses and Elijah, who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, Moses probably represents the law, because he's considered the lawgiver. And Elijah represents the prophets. He's one of the major prophets. Now, the main burden of the law and the prophets was the atonement that the Messiah would accomplish through his death. And consequently, the content of the discussion revolves around his coming death. Verse 31, his departure. Now we're not told what that discussion was or why they entered into it. So I can't go into that at all with you. But we can look at Peter's reaction to the site. Matthew account, chapter 17, verse 4. 
So in the left hand column, drop down below the gap to verse 4, page 119. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles, three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Now Peter is often criticized for this statement. People often, commentators often take Peter to task for this. But uh, let's look at it from a different point of view. Peter is seeing the glory that the Son of Man will have in the kingdom. But he's partially blind. He doesn't see fully at this point. So he does not yet understand the full pro program of the, of the Messiah's death and resurrection. His assumption is that the kingdom is now going to be established. Now Peter knows about the Feasts of Israel in Leviticus 23. And he knows about the prophetic significance of the Feast of, Tabern of Tabernacles. He knows that that feast will be fulfilled by the coming of the kingdom. He knows Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14 says that the celebration of tabernacles will be mandatory for all nations during the kingdom. So he's assuming the kingdom will now be established. And so he wants to build tabernacles. Now the response itself is proper. The problem is that Peter doesn't understand the timing. He's partially blind. He does not comprehend that Passover must be fulfilled prior to tabernacles. A death must come before the establishment of the kingdom. The only thing that's wrong here is his timing. That's all. He doesn't understand the timing because he is still partially blind. All right, let's go to page 14. Oh, by the way, there's another correction you should make on page 13. From the bottom of the page, count up one, two, three, four, five, six sentences. And you will come to the sentence that says, Assuming that the kingdom will now be established, the he is capitalized. That would imply that it's Jesus. The he should be a lowercase because it's Peter. So just cross out the word he and put the word Peter in there. Peter wanted to build the three tabernacles. Okay, Make sure we know who we're talking about there. That page, I must have gotten interrupted by phone calls or something <laughs> on that page. Didn't do too well. All right. Only two mistakes. Yeah, yeah, but that gives me There's about... More. Yeah. It, it, was, it was probably a computer glitch. It probably wasn't my fault at all. Probably an electrical surge, something like that. All right, page 14. Page 14. On page 14, we'll pick it up on verse 5. Verse 5. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, now we have a message from the Father. And the bright cloud here is the Shekinah glory cloud again. This is the glory cloud assist, uh, associated with the visible manifestation of God's presence in the Old Testament. And the voice there would be the voice of the Father. Now this is the second time in the ministry of the Messiah that an audible voice is heard from heaven concerning him. Now in Jewish thinking this is called a bat kol. This is called a bat kol, a heavenly voice, divine voice. And so the message is this. You've heard Moses and the prophets. Now it's time for you to hear my son. And this exact idea is picked up by the writer of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Picks up this same idea. God, after he had spoken long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And notice, and he is the radiance of his glory. That's a reference back to the transfiguration, I think. And the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. 
So I think the, the writer of Hebrews is looking right back to this event. All right, let's go on to verses 6 through 8. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were much afraid. Boy, I would be. I, I tell you, my body print would be in Mount Hermon to this day. <laughs> Believe me, Bob was here. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. So when the cloud lifts, Moses and Elijah are gone, and Jesus alone is left there. All right, now in the uh, middle of page 14, we come across a little chart entitled, The Theological Significance of the Transfiguration. So let's through, move through these six points. First of all, the transfiguration is important to us because number one, it authenticates Yeshua's Messiahship even though it was rejected by men. This is my beloved son. He said that when Yeshua was identified to the nation at his immersion, at his baptism, and now after his rejection, it is confirmed. This is my beloved son. Peter, you were right. Peter's got it. Okay? Secondly, it's an anticipation of the earthly kingdom. During the kingdom, his glory will not be veiled. And that's what Peter picks up in 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18. This event must have burned itself into Peter's memory. I don't think he ever forgot it in the slightest. I think he dreamed about it at night. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. I've seen it, says Peter. For when he received glory and honor from God the Father, such an, as, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard the utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter never forgot. Never. Never. So Yeshua's glory will no longer be veiled. Point three. The transfiguration guarantees the fulfillment of all scripture. Peter goes on in verse 19 to say this. Because of the transfiguration, we have the prophetic word made more sure. To which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now I hate to be critical of pastors, but an awful lot of pastors don't pay attention to prophecy. It's too hard. It's too confusing. It's too divisive. There are more important things. Well, not according to 2 Peter. Peter says, you do well to pay attention to prophecy as a lamp shining in a dark place. Why? Why does he say that? Well, I think it's because the lamp shining in a dark place gives us hope when we're surrounded by this dark world. You know, if this room went entirely dark, so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, and one exit sign lit up, you would have hope. You'd know where to go. And in this world, when the darkness of a job loss, when the darkness of cancer, when the darkness of a divorce, when the darkness of your children getting into drugs, when that kind of stuff envelops you, if you keep your eye on the light, you will have hope. And the prophecy points us to the Messianic Kingdom. And it's in the Messianic Kingdom where all these wrongs will be made right. We have a hope. We are not in a world that is going to grind us down into nothingness through injustice. Someday, everything will be made right. Amen. And prophecy points us in that direction. So we do well to pay attention to it as a lamp shining in the dark place until 
the day dawns until prophecy is fulfilled. So pay attention to it. Study the prophets. Now on one side we shouldn't ignore the prophets, like too many do, but on the other side we shouldn't we shouldn't do a rotten job of exegeting the prophets either. Many, 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 many people do a spectacular job of exegeting the prophets. Take it out of context. Let's stay in the middle. Let's do a good, solid, literal exegesis of the prophets and stay on track and not go from one side to the other because that is going to be a lamp shining in a dark place. So remember, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So it's for our benefit today. Prophecy is for our benefit. We shouldn't get fixated on it, but we should pay close attention to it. Believe me, if I didn't have the hope of the kingdom, you guys, I don't know what I would do. I just don't know. All right, so the transfiguration guarantees the fulfillment of all scripture. Fourthly, the transfiguration is a pledge of life beyond. You know, Moses did die. And so he would represent the resurrection of the saints. Elijah did not die. So he would represent the translated, the raptured saints. So we have a pledge of life beyond. They appeared in glory. Fifthly, the transfiguration is a picture of what it cost Jesus to come on our behalf. He had to veil his glory twice. First at the incarnation, in that cute little baby body, right? And secondly, after the transfiguration, the Father closed the veil back over him again. And that, point six, is a measure of his love for us. He was willing to go through that twice for you and me. All right, let's turn our attention to page 15 and the chart. You see the chart is entitled, the chart is entitled, The Messianic Significance of the Feasts of Israel. And there the uh, feasts of Leviticus 23 are laid out in chronological order from top to bottom. Uh, please note that the first feast, the first row, is Passover. And then drop all the way down to the bottom of the chart. And the final feast is Tabernacles, or Sukkot. So the Passover and all that it represents comes first. And then Tabernacles and all that it represent, represents comes last. For some reason, Peter did not understand this timing. He, uh, he knew about Zechariah 14. That we know for sure. But he didn't quite put it all in the proper context. Passover has to come before tabernacles. So go ahead and um, look over that chart. You can study it on your own, but it will give you a good overview of the feasts of Israel. All right, let's go on to section 122. It's a short section, and we have enough time to cover it. So we're now at page 16, top of the page, with the healing, with the command to keep the transfiguration. Let's see, section 122. Uh, yeah, top of page 16. Uh, the command to keep the transfiguration secret. So let's pick it up in the um, Mark account. Section 122 is in the middle of page 120. And the Mark account is verses 9 and 10. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man should raise, rise from the dead. And they seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead might mean. They are partially blind. They don't see it yet. They don't understand Passover yet. The uh, Luke account. Go over to the right to the Luke uh, statement there, verse 36b. 
And they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. So they obey Yeshua's orders and Yeshua is continually and consistently applying the policy of secretly, of secrecy. He's put that policy in effect since the rejection of his Messiahship. He is busy training the twelve now, again, for the mission they will have after he goes away. He is not proclaiming to the nation. He is training the twelve. All righty. Wow, look at that. The morning class must have been a lot more, had a lot more questions than you guys. So we've got uh, five minutes, so I'll let you go five minutes early. We'll pick it up on section 123 next week. Is that, do you want a question? Q&A. Q&A. No, I'm not good at Q&A, you guys. All right, let me, let, me, uh, let me close in prayer. You can come up afterwards, okay? That's my way to wiggle out of this. <laughs> All right. Father, again, we want to thank you for Jesus, your son, your beloved son. Help us to obey your command to hear him. To pay attention to him as the writer of Hebrews picked it up. And Lord, we trust that this section of scripture will give us a deeper appreciation for who your son is, what he's done for us. But help us to learn, Lord. We admit to you that we are only partially sighted now. We have questions. We don't understand it all. But I know that if we study your word, and walk in the light of what we do have, you will bring understanding to us day by day, year by year. And that understanding will change our lives. We'll look back after a few years and we'll say, oh yeah, now I understand things that confused me and I see I'm a different person. So help us to embrace your training and to uh, do our best to Keep our eye focused on you and your kingdom, your kingdom program, so that we will never lose hope. And help us to pass that on to those who are surrounded by the darkness of this world. And we ask this, as we do every week, in Yeshua's name. Amen. We'll see you next week. <laughs>